Shall we? Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for your presence here. We thank you for the, the ability to laugh. We thank you for the. We thank you that we're all different from each other, and yet we're all one with each other in spirit. We complement each other. And bless us with your presence, and bless us with your with your life and your blood and your enthusiasm and father we know that there's a reason for this humidity in this air and we welcome it because it's from you so thank you for that too and just bless us and bless everybody and bless our brains and bless our ability to hear and understand and see and just give us the touch of heaven that magic fairy wand of heaven that'll touch us and make us glow to all of the realities of heaven this day Thank you in Jesus' name, amen. When all is said and done, why there are uh, 13 is supposed to be a, a, an unlucky number, and yet there are three thir 13s in the New Testament that are simply wonderful. 13th chapter of John, 13th chapter of Romans, and 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. They're all very, very good, and they're all on the same. Three of the great, well, the real core of what the Bible is all about is contained in those uh, chapters. 13th chapter, John says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even, of, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have loved one for another. Now we flip over here to the 13th chapter of Romans. I skipped them way too far. That's not Romans. 13th chapter of Romans says, Owe no man, no, owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this sentence, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. That's putting it easy. And of course we all know the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and if I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. I don't know whether it's Wiest or who it, uh, who, it, uh, who it is that in translating this uh, puts it in a way that at least makes just a little bit more sense to me. He says, if I do all these things and know not the love of God in my heart, I am nothing. In other words, you could, you could gain the whole world, you could be as successful as success is, and yet, if you did not know what the love of God was in your heart, what good would it be? You would, uh, you would end life uh, with life not being worth it if you know not the love of God in your heart. You sometimes wonder about, uh, it is the love of God why, why he says that some of our prayers are, are not to be answered. And it is the love of God that says that some of our prayers are, and it is the love of God that says that the answer to a lot of the, a lot of the requests that we make is not yet. You're just plain not ready for it yet. Sometimes we ask for, ask for, ask for things without realizing what we're asking, asking for. This isn't, uh, this is not a criticism of the man, but how, but how about Mr. Y Mr. Young, who, whose dreams, whose all his dreams came true. The thing that he wanted, he was going to have it more than anything else to be the head of the greatest railroad in the whole world, the New York Central. And he got it, and yet the pressures must have been so unimaginably unbearable that the man had to blow his brains out. All his dreams came true, and all that it meant to him was that he had to kill him, kill himself. So the love of God oftentimes says, no, you don't know what you're asking for. 
But I'll give to you, if you trust me moment by moment, I'll give to you the things that you can stand and, and, and undertake, and if you'll just rejoice in them to the extent that you're able to rejoice in what you have now, you are preparing yourself and, and expanding your capacities to rejoice and to love where you are now, then you're, it's like exercising a muscle. It gets bigger and stronger and it's able to stand more. And by doing and reveling and loving the thing, the place where you are now, why you're preparing yourself for something bigger. But trust me to give it to you at the right time. First Peter, it says, finally, all, all of you have a spirit of, uh, have, a, have unity of spirit, sympathy, love of the brethren, a tender heart and a humble mind. Do not return evil for, for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you have been called that you may obtain a blessing. And Peter says also, above all, hold unfailing love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Practice hospitality ungrudgingly to one another unfailing love for one another. Hold, un no, hold unfailing your love for one another. You know, in some of the older trans translations, such as the King James and some other ones, the American uh, version of 1900, I believe, or the English, English one, it's, uh, it's where, where it says in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, love never faileth. That's what Peter's saying here. Hold unfailing your, your, your don't let it waver, <clears throat> whether it's accepted or not. Don't let the interior condition of, of, of what you are be determined by how others happen to react to it. Whether they like it or whether they don't, make love your aim, goodwill, make it unfailing. And in another version of the old, uh, uh, old version, in the 13th chapter, 1 Corinthians, it says, love never ends. That's the same thing. And a friend of mine says, well, sure, it, 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 it never fails because it never ends. And that makes, uh, make, makes a lot of sense also. It's only when we, be, when we get to the point where we get tired when we get discouraged and we feel, oh, well, he or she isn't, uh, is, isn't responding, or life isn't responding in some way or other, and we get tired and we give up. And when love ends, all ends. And in the first uh, epistle of John, it says, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love remains in death. Because love comes to, without love, there isn't anything that makes any sense. But if anyone have the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? This love isn't just a feeling. The father and mother or the brother or sister who goes out and works day by day to provide a home, to pay the bills at the end of the, end of the, end of the month, to clothe people. There isn't necessarily any great passionate feeling there. There isn't necessarily any great emotion day after day, but this person who goes out day after day, year in and year out, to provide food and clothing and an, edu and an education and everything, that's love. That's sharing. Yeah, that's actually sharing your life with somebody else. That's stewardship because... What you give out in the way of brains and what you give out in the way of sweat and, uh, and everything else when you, you go to work, you're exchanging your life for some money in order that you may provide those that you love with the things that they need. So you're giving your life for them. I remember sitting in a, in a, in a, in a board meeting in church. And they were talking about and they were actually haggling over the building of, a, of, a, of an educational wing under the church. And there wasn't much that was, uh, there, w there wasn't actually anything which was said about love. I don't, I, I don't think the term love was actually used. But here, all these men, they were comparing bids. Why? Well, there were a lot of men on that board 
who would not see that educational wing? And there were a lot of other men on that board who would probably just see that edu educational wing of the church for just a few years. That's, yet they were working and providing and laying plans for a campaign to get money for something that they themselves would, uh, would, en would enjoy very, very little. And a, lot of the, and a lot of the people on that board, their children were already grown up. This was for somebody else's kids. This was for some children that were not yet born, generations after generations who would come after them. That's love. That's practical. That's a practical kind of love. He says, little, uh, little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in deed and in truth. In other words, get up and do something, uh, some, something about it. Don't let it remain just a, just, a, just, just a feeling. And we receive from him whatever we ask because we keep his commandments and do what he, what he pleases. What commandments? That you love one another as I have loved you. Now there's a very con a most conditioning phrase in there, as I have loved you. In the first place, uh, Jesus was uh, Jesus. Uh, Jesus did not put his mind or his brains into his pocket. He understood the, the history and the tradition of his people. He understood the Bible of his day. I believe if you go back, you will find out that in the Gospels alone that there are about 180 or so instances where Jesus quotes Scripture. Jesus knew his knew knew his Bible. He was soaked in it, and his and from his parents forcing him, I'm sure, in those early years to go to the synagogue school and go through the prayers which uh, which the average home of that day went through night and day. What they fed him in later years, it fed him the the words, the things, and when something came into into his mind, why, why something out of scripture, out of the past, out out of the tradition of his love, love doesn't mean that you can that you that you can just forget about your brains. I'm sure that it's been it's it's been it's been said by others. I'm sure that that God could paint a masterpiece. Uh, through somebody, somebody who was totally untrained. But the fact remains, they said, that he hasn't. He has taken individuals who have spent years studying composition and color and everything else, and he has taken instruments that have been refined and trained and tempered, and said, all right, now I'll fill you with inspiration. And you'll do something that will last forever and ever. So you're supposed to train your body and train your mind and train your, your temperament and your to be obedient instruments and servants. Furthermore, the other love of God is that he doesn't coerce or force you to do anything. He doesn't use you. He doesn't sort of, uh, sort of the only term I can think of uh, is prostitute you. And I use that term because just recently I saw something that was so beautiful and so deathly and so horrible and so horrible, all mixed up into the into the same way. I saw the result of a man who had given his body over to other spirits willingly. Now, uh, this isn't anything to get afraid of, for. Actually, we do it all the time. And the Lord said, it's the same mechanism. He said, ask me to come in and I'll take up my body. That's where he's going to come in and possess you. But there are individuals who have done it in this other way, and this man had. And he gave some of the most uh, amazing lectures that I imagine have ever been heard. The people of one country really are... I don't mean all of the people, but a large section of the people of one country were at his feet. They paid tremendous sums of money to come to hear him, hear him talk. Individuals in government came to seek his advice and everything else. And uh, I saw a movie of this man speaking. And you know, his face, face had as much animation in him as a piece of steel. 
he was taken over by something else. But here's the other, other, other thing that I saw. He painted, I don't know how many pictures, and I had been and and, and I had been hearing uh, about these pictures. And they were most wonderful. Things. I really had. I'm still thrilled over what I saw. In fact, it's unbelievable. Beautiful pictures of scenery of all sorts, and they evidently must have come from from some other spirit who had been some kind of an artist in some other life and took him over, because they said he. He could paint them upside down or sideways or anything, and he got done, and he didn't know what he had done. And now this is a literal fact. And when they got through with him, they just let him go, and his, the end of his life was he was just an empty shell. They, these spirits, used his body, just plain used his body. Now that's the difference between that and the love of God that says, no, I don't, I don't want you to be a robot. That's why God doesn't coerce us into loving him. Love has to be a free, voluntary thing. Free will, freedom is part of the very nature of God and he couldn't impose anything but freedom on anybody else. He couldn't make a prisoner out of anybody and say, this prisoner loves me. He couldn't make a slave out of anybody and say, this, this slave loves me because that slave couldn't do anything else but do what, he, do what he did. Freedom is of the very nature of God. And this love of God is freedom. Freedom is even one of the attributes of the very angels themselves. For in the wisdom of, the, uh, in the wisdom of Scripture, or in the wisdom of the ancients, it says that, uh, that Lucifer, or Satan himself, was an angel who had the right and the opportunity to, re to rebel. Did you ever stop to think of that? That God wouldn't even hold the angels to him through force or coercion. So that when a lot of people come into, uh, into, uh, into the into the church or into the first knowledge of God, they're afraid that God's going to force them to do this or force them to do that or force them to be a missionary or force them to, or force them to go to live in the slums in some rescue mission. Listen, he won't force you to do anything. He'll just hold up his love before you day by day by day. And he'll draw you with his love. It will be an attraction. Sometimes we're afraid that we, we want to change and we're afraid that we'll change against our will. You'll never change against your will because God built you in such a way and God is so wonderful and so great that he would never force you to do anything against your will. There's a story that is told about, uh, uh, about a mama and her, and her little boy. And he came into the house this day, and boy, he was just weeping buckets of buckets of tears, and she asked him what the trouble was, and uh, he said, why, they say that, uh, that I'm, going to, I'm going to have to give up my little red, red wagon when I grew up, and, he, and she said, why, she said, you don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to give up anything. Nobody is ever going to, going to take your little red wagon away from you. You can have that wagon just as long as you want it, and nobody will ever take that wagon away from you. And boy, he just broke into a big smile, and, and he went out, and he played for a while, and after, and after a bit he came back, and he was weeping buckets once, once, once more, and she said, now, what's the, what's the matter now? He says, I'm, I'm afraid that, that someday I'll grow up, and I won't want it. <laughs> You don't have to be afraid of anything of that sort. That's why love will win. Fear is bound to drive a person into a corner so he will rebel. Love that stands there day after day. Patience. You know, if love is anything, it's patience. At least that's been the, that's been the experience that, that I have personally had, that love is patience. And when I think of the experiences that I've had in these camps over a period of years, both from a way back long before I ever went to a full-time camp, I would go up there weekends, and I cer certainly didn't, uh, I certainly wasn't very, very nice to many people. 
Or I just plain didn't like them. They are just a bunch of screwballs, all of them. They were the kind of people, they were, they're like, they're like, they were like some relatives that you don't mention, so. And I would come back into the city and they would say, well, where have you been? And I'd say, oh, out there. But I would never say, where? And I'll tell you right now, I wouldn't be where I, where I am if it hadn't been for almost unfailing patience and goodwill. That is the most hard, that is the thing that sort of rings your heart more than anything else, is that every so often a, an individual will get off the beam and probably do things that he or she shouldn't. And that's the very time when we should go up to that individual and love them more than ever. And that seems to be the very time among so many Christian people when they are like a bunch of cows around a cow that is sick, eating all the grass from around the cow to starve them out. And so often when I have seen individuals uh, 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 do things that are wrong where they are the prisoner actually of their own temperament or emotion or wrong thoughts or whatever, ever it is, but they fall, call it any kind of a word that you want. And everybody sort of, uh, sort of, sort of pulls their skirts around themselves and leaves them destitute. Well, that's a, just the wrong time to do that. You remember when they, when the, uh, when they came down from the mountain, from the Mount of Transfigur Transfiguration, and uh, there was a man there that had a no. It was when the ruler came and his daughter was sick and. Jesus is on the way. The servants come and said, Don't trouble the master anymore. Your daughter's dead. And precisely at that moment when everybody ordin ordin ordinarily would have left them in faith, Jesus said, Fear not, only believe. You go to a person who has made a fool out of themselves. You go to a person immediately when they've done something wrong. You go to a person when they're immediately beginning to put up their guard and shut everybody out, either through fear or through guilt or through something else, and you go to that person, and boy, that's exactly the time they need to hear somebody say, I believe in you. That's exactly the time that they need somebody to say, I love you. And if you do that then, then the time will... If you don't do it then... It doesn't mean anything to go up to them when they're, when they're walking the straight and narrow path and put your arms around them. And so it's when they get off the beam that they need somebody to come to them and say, Listen, boy, I'm still for you. And when you begin to consider this element of sin or love, if you, if you will hear, uh, somebody once asked me, Was there, Is there... Is there any difference in sins or in, or, or in sins? If you had a sort of a scale to weigh wrongdoing in some fashion, or is there any difference in it? And of course, uh, ultimately the answer is no. But you can also say this, that Jesus was a heck of a lot tougher and more ruthless on sins of the spirit than he was on sins of the flesh. Now, you just, you, you just go over your Bible and see. He railed a lot more and was more disgusted and irritated and angry with hypocrisy than he was with drunkenness. And that's just, a, just about exactly the opposite way to the way that we actually live. The drunk or the individual who does, who falls over in a rather gross way whether it's drinking or whatever it is, those are the people that we run from, that we think, oh, that, uh, he's just outside the pale. I've got a friend, and, uh, and um, he was on his way to Europe, and he was in New York City on his way, and he was walking up uh, uh, Park Avenue, and all of a sudden he fell over with a heart attack. And he said for about 20 minutes, people just walked around him because they were sure he was drunk. They were sure that in some way or other this was, this was just another drunk that had fallen on the sidewalk. 
And finally, a uh, uh, cop came up and he moved, and he and he bent over him and he said, uh, "Are you drunk?" And he said, "No, but I but I but I wish that I were." He had been lying there in pain for a horrible pain, and he was in bed for eight months after that. But you see what that symbolized. Now, a lot of people were walking along there who were well-dressed, who were probably uh, in their own way. As far as spiritual sins go, were a lot worse off. Hypocrisy, anger, hate, jealousy, fear, in competition trying to cut the other fellow's throat. In the sight of God, if the way Jesus acted and spoke is literally true, those sins are much more serious than the man who is grossly a prisoner of his, of his materiality or his material body in some way or other. For the sins of the Spirit are worse. Now, someday you're going to drop off this old body, but I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know of anything that says that someday that you're going to drop off your spirit, for you are spirit. Better, better to better, and there have been individuals that I that I have heard of where an alcoholic, strange as it may seem, one of the most spiritual people that I have been told that there ever was, tender, kind, loving, yet seemingly every so often driven by some insatiable something or other that nobody knew why. Finally, when he was in his last illness and they took him into a big hospital in New York, he had been a flyer during the last war and they had crashed. I don't know if it was flying the hump or, or someplace over there in India or Burma, but he had crashed and he had been hurt. And they found out, a, 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 a way too late though, they found out that the back of his head had been, had been hurt. And that somehow or other in there that it, that it affected something of him. I don't remember all of, the, all of the ins and outs of it. But they were sorry that in some way or other that they, that they hadn't found this out sooner. That, that, he, that every so often that because of this, this mashing in the, in the, in the back, is, his nervous system would just go berserk and just make him into a piece of stone almost with tension. And then came the drinking and everything else. Now whether that was the cause of the drinking, I can't say. But it certainly was a, a very, very high contributing factor. Sometimes we judge people in ways that we wouldn't want to be judged ourselves. I think that love, if it's, if it's anything else also, love is understanding. It's pretty hard to condemn anybody when you understand them, when you understand why they are the kind of people they are. The fact of the matter is, if you, if you could understand why an individual, uh, 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 the heredity of them, the environment of them, the thoughts which have conditioned them, uh, you could not condemn them. I remember that there was a court case, a court case in Oklahoma City, uh, oh, three or four years back, where this individual, I don't know whether he was sentenced to death or if he was sentenced to life imprisonment, but the judge uh, 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 said, gave one of the most wonderful speeches that there has ever been, and he, the judge railed against society that had made this man into what he had for, I forget what the story of his life was, but from how he had been treated by the police from the time he was a boy, and every other way from the time that he was, society had made him into what he was. And the judge says, though I have to sentence him, not only for the protection of society, but for his own pro protection, the fault is not with the individual, but it's with society that made him that way. You might someday have to, uh, have to sentence somebody to a mental hospital. You might have to sentence somebody to prison. You might have to do all those things. But boy, there's a lot of difference be between that and condemning any anybody. You just cannot do it. Love is understanding. And the more you understand about anybody, 
Sometimes it seems that an individual is a cold fish, and yet when and yet when you get to know that in, individual, he or she is just plain scared. They're just plain scared of themselves. They wish in any way under the sun that somebody would come would come would come up to them and be friendly to them. Love is service. That's one of the ways that an individual gets over this attitude. What you give, you receive. There's a, that's why a wallflower, if he or she's going to, going to remain a wall, wallflower, all they'll gather about them are more wallflowers. Whatever you give, you receive. Now, if you go out and smile at somebody, uh, Dunlop, Dunlop, uh, uh, Hal, or oh, I for... I forget his name now, but he's in Shreveport, Louisiana. And he told about one of the assignments that he had in the Dale Carnegie speaking course was to go up the main street of town or one of the one of the main streets of town on a Saturday morning and just smile at everybody who came by. And he said by the time he got up there, why, wow, goodness knows how many hundred people had smiled b- back at him. And life was wonderful. He was planting a smile over every, everyone, and he got it back. But he was just smiling once, or one continuous smile. It came back to him a hundredfold, just like you plant a seed of wheat, a seed of corn or something. It doesn't come back one for one, but it comes back a hundredfold or eightyfold or whatever. It's multiplied any, anyway. If you want to have friends... Be friendly. If you want to be loved, just love everybody that you know. And if you want a real working definition of love, it's a very simple and a very practical one. For uh, this term, love can be used in in a hundred million ways. But if you want a practical definition for love, for a practical and fruitful life, it's do unto others as you'd have others do unto you. Now that's just about, that sums up the whole thing in a very practical way. Now that doesn't mean that if you're going to be honest with yourself that somebody's going to come up to you constantly and pat you on the back and say you're wonderful. Sometimes they'll do just exactly the opposite. The best friends that I have are those who when I have needed it have told me off. And the best friends that you have when you're wrong, they're not going to stand by your side and say that you're right. Jesus didn't. Uh, Jesus is the example of love, and he didn't confirm people in their weakness. If they were wrong, he said so. But he didn't send them away. When Peter was wrong, he didn't say, "Well, I'm through with you, boy. You're, I've, I've, I've spent these three years on you, and all I get out of it is a weak sister who's going to." deny me. He said, Peter, look, this is going to happen, but I've prayed for you. Don't you see how that good? He never asked anybody to do but what he did himself. You remember back in the Sermon on the Mount? Pray for those who despitefully use you. He did it. Peter, I've prayed for you. You're going to treat me like a dirty skunk, but I'm praying for you. Then when you have reestablished yourself and come back, you're going to be able, because of this, to help a lot of other people. Strengthen thy brethren. Isn't that wonderful? Love is not agreement. But love is so big that it will give the other individual the right to make a mistake if that's the way he or she has to go. A woman at the Canuga, uh North Carolina camp some years back, she came up to me and, oh, she had some sons and she was wanting to almost tell them every time when they should blow their nose or do anything else. These were grown sons. They had wives and they had children of their own. And she was anxious and she wanted me to pray for this and pray for that for them and I just flatly refused to do anything of that. And I said, why in the world don't you, don't, you, don't you love your sons enough to let them make their own mistakes? For oftentimes that's the only way any of us can, can grow. If we're only going to love people when they're... Our love has to be like the rain and the sunshine. Jesus said, uh, 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 the rain shines on the good and the evil and the, and the sunshine on the just and on the unjust. I think that's simply wonderful. 
When I become so much faith, so much love inwardly that that's the kind of a person I am and that I'm not putting on a show or a technique of love. There is a technique of love. You can say, well, in order to love somebody, you've got to smile at them, you've got to put your arms around them, and you've got to pat them on the back, and you've got to say pretty things to them and all that stuff. And 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 you begin to think, now, how do you love? Well, that's a, that's a biggest, that's, a, that's the... The surest sign that you're not love. For if you were love, you would just do the thing that comes naturally. And the same thing goes as to how to have faith, or how or how to be childlike. You say, well, how does a kid act and all that? And that's the greatest proof in the world that you're not childlike. For a child just acts naturally and does the thing that it wants to do. So you've got to be in the uh, when you're in love. Love fulfills everything else. Love fulfills the law of faith. When you're filled with love and the joy of life and feel that you're not afraid of anything. Perfect love or complete love. And by perfect love it means uh, uh, loving completely. Not just a little bit here, but uh, like the rain and the sunshine that you, you're just, it falls down on everything. Instead of being like our little watering cans where we will water a bit here and we'll say, well, now, this plant here doesn't, uh, doesn't look as if it's worth some water, so I'll just skip that one and I'll go over to, over to here. That's the way a lot of us love. We'll say, well, I'm going to love him or her, but, but she, or, uh, she doesn't look as if she'll res respond to me, so I'll skip her and I'll go over to him and so on. That isn't love. That isn't. That is not a hundred percent. When you become, when you, when you just act naturally, and that acting naturally means to do good, to be kind, to be honest, to be loving, to to do the thing that will be best. Uh, then you will have love. And of course, love makes the fulfill, as they say, love is, a, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Love is the secret of obedience. Of course, we said that love is service. You want to know what love does? There is a man that I know who years, uh, who years, years ago ran a collection agency, and that's a rough business, boy. And times weren't too good. And a lot of bills weren't being weren't being paid as they ought ought to have been paid. So he had to go and call on shops and stores and and try to collect money. And he went into this business and boy, this uh, this guy was just as mad at him and just as hateful of him. And he wanted to throw him out. And he was going to do everything else under the sun. Finally, this guy says, "Look," he says, "I'm not here to ruin you. I'm here to help you." It wouldn't do me any good to, to, uh, to in some way or, or other foreclose on you or to take this stuff back. I would hurt you and your store would fold up and we would lose a customer and so on. He says, I'm here to help you. Now, now he says, I've had years and years and years of experience in the collection business and I can help you to collect the things that are rightfully yours. And he spent two days with him showing him how to write letters of collection, how to have them mimeographed and in the process of it he taught this man how in a business way to get down on his knees and pray and how to send out these collection letters with good will that he wasn't trying to uh, uh, stick out his chin and say I'm going to get mine but he said uh, you're going to do this because this you deserve it and wherever there's anybody else are out there that you can help to be a better person, you're going to do it. You're going to send these things out. You're going to do unto others as you would wish others would do unto you. He says, I'm not here to ruin your business. I'm here to help you. And now that's love. That's love in the business sense. That man stayed in business. And what's more, that man became a Christian. You want to know what love is? I know a salesman out on the west, west coast, and he travels over a number of states. And every so often he goes into an office where somebody, somebody is, uh, looks, as, looks as if they're having a hard time. And he's been in that territory for many, many years, so everybody knows him. 
And every so often they know that in some way or other he prays. And so whenever it seems that there's anything he can do, he's got little pamphlets with him. Now, he doesn't go standing on the street corners and, uh, and ramming a track into everybody's hand. But whenever he has a friend uh, for a certain things who looks as if he's having a hard time, he's of the kind who will go to him and say, Look, I have read this thing over. Why don't you read it? See if you can get any good out of it, and if you can't find, and if you can't, throw it in the waste paper basket. And through that, individuals have had him, because they know that he's a man's man, and that he is not what you would call a religious fanatic, but that he's a, just a real wonderful guy who has peace and love in his heart, they have him pray for their family problems and everything else. Love makes you feel wanted. Love sort of opens arms and draws you, draws you in. There's a wonderful story about Joseph Fort Newton, one of the great ministers of our time who is dead now. But he was called over to City Temple in London, England, as their minister, and he wasn't over there very long, but he just knew that he had made a mistake. The English people were cold. Uh, he, he missed the warmth of the, of the American audience. Everything seemed so distant. And this Sunday, as he was walking from the place where he lived over to the, over to the church, he had just about made up his mind that, that, he, that he was going to see the board and resign and go back. Tell them that in some way or other he had failed them, that he was sorry, that in some fashion or other there wasn't this warmth or oneness of spirit that he needed to be the kind of a person that he ought to be. And he said, as he opened the door of his study, there was a big bouquet of American beauty roses on the, on the table there. And he knew that somebody had been thinking of him. And, and his, suddenly these English people who seemed to be so cold and so unapproachable in every way, suddenly he saw that there was something there that was loving and kind. And immediately, because somebody sent him a bunch of roses, he felt it, felt it, felt it home. Just a little act of love of that sort. I know a man who goes to an old lady's apartment, way up in her 80s, and all she's doing literally is waiting there to die, literally. She is a little too feeble to get out often, and she's got one and a half rooms, and she's got just enough money to pay the bills, for it and eat very, very sparingly. So this man who doesn't have to, who is much younger than she is, he goes over there once every week and, and, and takes about two hours and reads to her and talks with her. That's love also. There isn't any possibility of him being repaid for that except to be repaid with that good feeling on the inside. Love is off God because love is God. I'll tell you, love endures forever. And love will take the sting out of anything. And if an individual can become love inwardly, then all the rest of the problems he has, it's no... It, it just isn't happenstance, I'm sure, that when Paul speaks of the fruit of the Spirit, he puts love first. And somebody has said, sure, it comes her, because love includes all of the other things. If you can love enough, you've got faith, peace, joy, gentleness, goodness, meekness, kindness, well, just everything, everything else. So if you had to choose just one thing to be, and one thing to seek after in this life, it's just plain love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. For Now you just lead us through the rest of this day in goodness and kindness and love in helpfulness, in thanksgiving, in service, in honesty, in truth. Just fill us so much with your love that, uh, that we'll just radiate it wherever we go. In Jesus' name, amen.